Gloucestershire, we've got quite a lot of large country houses. We've got about 72 big ones, and that's not counting the sort of smaller manor houses, such as the ones at Dowdswell or Boddington that you come across. Um, most of these are what you call reduced circumstances now, and they've lost their surrounding estates, but some have survived intact. Um, and oddly, which I think is interesting, none of the big country houses are actually owned by the royals. They all seem to own the second tier smaller houses. So you've got Anne at Gatcombe, Charles at Highgrove, and until 2005, you've got the Kents at Netherlippiot. Um, but they go, they don't have huge estates immediately around them either, although they also used to have more security and stuff around them. Um, the real big three, South Gloucestershire ones, um, these are the ones that have come through time really as such as large mansions in big estates, and they're all in South Gloucestershire. Um, so you've got Babington House, Doddington House, Durham Park, they're the three main ones. And interestingly, I find they've got on this alignment for some reason, it's a purely geographical thing, but they are there. Um, so what we're going to look at with these three, we're going to focus on these three. So we're going to look at elements of their history, give a sort of quick rundown of their history. Um, and we're really going to look at the stuff that surrounds the house and maybe how they function. So we're going to be looking at ancillary buildings, sort of estate accounts, that sort of thing, rather than the gentry families that lived in them. You know, that they're, I mean, the, the family trees of these sort of owners of these houses are crazy and I, I can't get my head around them. So I think that's something, if you're interested, try the family history society they'd be much better on that sort of thing um, we'll start off with Babington House. Um, it's easily one of the best known houses in the country and the county, um, thanks to the horse trials. Um, however, it started off as what they call an irregular courtyard manor house. It was owned by the Bartelia family. And you can see this image here, which we thanks, give thanks to the Babington estate for allowing us to show some of their material today, because usually you can't see this sort of stuff. You can't, certainly can't copy it and show it. Um, but say that was the house, you know, looks fair, fairly grand as it was. Um, in 1612, the whole thing was sold to the Earl of Worcester, um, who gave it to his son as a birthday present. So it's not a little bad sort of a birthday present to get, is it? You know, get a whole country estate. Um, by by way of sort of marriage and, and then sort of other sons, it passed to Henry III, Marquis of Worcester in 1655. And when he was appointed <coughs> first Duke of Beaufort in 1682, that's when he sort of like came into the real money and created this sort of massive Palladian mansion that, that we see today. And, it, and it's a very, very big, impressive house. Um, the last substantial building work was undertaken by William Kent as early as 1745. So, you know, since then, um, not a lot has actually altered on the house. Kent went on to work on the gardens and the rest of the estate, notably this Worcester Lodge, which lies on the northern edge of the estate, about three miles away from the house, along what they call the Worcester Avenue. And we'll see another one of these views in a moment. Um, Durham. Durham is a Baroque country house, ain't an ancient deer park. It's written history, actually, it's one of the earliest ones, it begins around 972 when it was a manorial estate belonging to Persia Abbey up in Worcester. Um, Doomsday Book records it as being transferred from the Saxon Alfred to the Norman Thurston Fitzrolf, but by 1216 it had come into the hands of the Russell family. Um, and this, from this family, we get the first written evidence of it. So there's an estate survey on the death of Sir William Russell in 1311. And then subsequently, a second survey in 1416 does describe the house a little bit. It says it has a great hall, a great chamber and wine cellars. But we know that by the time it came into the hands of William Blathwaite, <laughs> Bathwaite family and they're associated with Durham Park, um, that they came into the family about 1688. We know that the, by this time the house was quite badly dilapidated and, and run down. Um, Blathwaite, he was a career diplomat, a civil servant, a massive income around about 4,000 a year. It's about 480 million today. So easily one of the richest people in the country. He obviously had all this cash, had this lovely house, so he actually rebuilt the whole thing. And he gave it the orangery, stables, and, and some, some lavish formal gardens. But surprisingly, from then on, no real major alterations took place. And so as the years passed, bit poorer, decline actually set into the house and it, and it began to get run down. Um, in 1956, it was body um, and they passed the National Trust as a culturally significant property. For some reason I'm getting a, you're now it's gone now, it's all right. Um, so again, it's quite an interesting place uh, and we'll look at it a bit more of it later.
Um, Doddington House, the other big one, that was the original seat of the Codring family, family, and it was in Didmartin, not in Doddington. And they had this house here, which you can see on the screen. Again, fairly nice house, fairly grand. Um, however, 1798, they decided it wasn't grand enough, so they up sticks and basically moved about a kilometre down the road to Doddington, where they'd already purchased an estate, and then they proceeded to build a much bigger house, a much better house. The old manor house does still exist, and you can still go and see it, but you can't see the new one for reasons that become apparent in a minute. Um, the original house at Doddington, large Elizabethan H-shaped building with the adjoining church. Most of these big houses had their own church. It was the sort of the, almost the private church of the family, if you like. And very often there are chapels in the churches that were reserved for the family's use. Um, however, 18th century, the family, the, the they grew very, very rich from slavery, sugar plantations in the West Indies. They owned the islands of Antigua and Barbuda, and at various times were the governors of the West Indies. And again, with all this profit coming out of the Indies, they embarked on a big expansion of the house and the estate. Um, 1764-ish Doddington's grounds, not massive, about 600 acres. They were laid out by Capability Brown in 1793. They were actually modified by two other famous landscape designers, William Eames and John Webb. Um, and then in 1796, the family engaged James Wyatt to remodel the old house. And again, when they say remodel, they tend to say it's virtually demolished and rebuilt. Um, and he did turn this old Elizabethan building into one of the, what they call the great neoclassical houses. But um, arguably, it's not the most attractive building in the world. It's a bit plain. Um, I certainly think sort of, you know, Durham's much nicer. Um, we have to look at slavery because it's an inescapable fact that many of the big country houses were funded by profits from slavery. And in this, we've got this example here, this is the Codrington's families. This is their Betty's Hope plantation in Antigua. Um, it's one of their sort of state books. They had a lot of information. Um, we know that when slavery was finally abolished, 1834, Codrington received about £32,000 compensation for the slave holdings, one of the, the biggest slave owners he was. It's about two million today. So, you know, it's, we can't escape this. Um, and there is at the moment going to be, there's a lot of work being done on this at the moment. So look out for reports on this sort of thing coming through the next couple of years. Um, National Trust have already done a good, very good, very useful report on it. So it's well worth looking that one up. Um, Gardens around these big country houses, well, they tend to fall into two ways. You've got the formal garden, then you had the kitchen gardens. Um, now, whereas the former gardens were sort of very often quite lavish on full display, the kitchen gardens were usually hidden away behind walled enclosures. It's almost like they didn't want to see them. Um, and these are two examples here. I mean, the one on the, on the left is at Durham, so it's one of the gardens at Durham. The one on the right, we go down to down Cornwall, and that's sort of the Carl Helligan Gardens. And they're, they're very good examples of, of walled gardens away. Barrington House just over the border is again it's another nice example of you get these beautiful gardens but then you get the hidden kitchen gardens. <coughs> Um, most of these houses, in the early days especially, um, were actually self-sufficient in food, um, even down to exotic fruits, grapes, lemons, oranges, peaches, melons and pineapples, which were, which were fantastic back then, they loved them. Um, and, you know, and to do this, they needed you know, the technology to do it. So they were usually grown in purpose-built heated greenhouses or in more elaborate structures, such as the famous curved orangery at Doddington, which you can see on the left-hand side there. Um, the Doddington estate is now owned by Dyson. Um, and he's got into serious trouble recently because he actually dug the whole centre of this up and put good swimming pool in it. Uh, he did it without planning permission as well. Um, so there was a th they, they threatened him with actually having to replace it all, but I don't know why. Somehow, I won't suggest that he money passed that. And in permission and he's allowed to keep the swimming pool. A more modest example is the vinery at Dr Jenner's house at Barclay and again if you go and go to the Jenner's house it's always worth having a look at this vinery to see the heating and how, how it operated. There was some some of them were very very clever how they worked. Um, Badminton, as you know, it's a much bigger house. This is the sort of the gardens, the view of the gardens by Johannes Kipp, who did a lot of the drawings of the estates. And you can again see how quite big these were. So on the sort of the bottom right here, you've got the ornamental sort of gardens, the formal gardens with the geometric patterns. Going towards the house, you've got the avenues, there's fountains in front of the building. 
on the right hand side it's sort of you know the less fashionable side you've got the orchards and you've got the kitchen gardens um you know one of the things it's worth looking at throughout time is how these gardens change because fashions came in and out so you know whereas 10 years ago or 20 years ago we had ground force now we don't get ground force we get something else going on tv so these things are remodeled according to what the fashions are and again they were often spare no sort of expense to get these done um, we know the formal gardens they could be planned down to the last detail and this is a rather nice drawing of a flower bed that occurs at Durham Park um, such work often required input from the famous gardeners and lots of them worked in these houses so we know we've already mentioned Lancelot Capability Brian Eames and Kent but John Webb and Humphrey Repton also worked in places around these um, we very often don't have the actual plants of these we don't know what was grown and I think I might mention that later the sheer scale of the land that these three big houses owned does make it difficult to illustrate in any detail so this is a plan of the Durham Park and it's the house and it's actually immediate park and that surrounds it and it's in the light blue grey colour it's on the left hand side you can see the black part of the house there so that's the house the rest of it was its parkland so again quite impressive you can see the lakes on the right hand side there so you know landscape in this you know it's it's it is a work it's going to take a long time to do but I mean this is just one part of the estate and if you zoom out on this map to here this shows the full extent of the lands that Durham House owned in 1844 and it was a relatively small estate only about 4,500 acres about seven square miles very small compared to Badminton Estate which is huge 52,000 acres which is about 81 square miles so you know it's, you know really the richer you were the more land you had the more land you can control and therefore you can have more for your gardens your own parks and gardens and I mentioned earlier about you know trying to appreciate these and this is one of the best views I think this is the view from Worcester Lodge at Badminton which is the, sort of the gatehouse and it's the ride down to Badminton House which you can see in the distance there it's about two and a half to three miles long and you know I think it's amazing thing you know, that one family owned all that land around it you know and, and you weren't hired on there at all um, it's it's you know, these rides are impressive. I mean, re near a home, I think the Sirencester rides are near, on the edge of the Sirencester part there. They're equally impressive, but they're nothing like this. This is amazingly huge. Um, deer parks, most of these houses are deer parks. Um, the oldest is Durham Park because um, we're pretty sure the name Durham derives from the Anglo-Saxon word Durham, which is, means an enclosure for deer. Um, the first park there was recorded by one of the early owners, William Dennis, who was an esquire to the king and later high sheriff of Gloucestershire. And he was granted a license to park or, or inform a park of 500 acres. Um, in 15 one, 151 it's not 151 it's 15 uh, 11 15 15 something like that um and he was also allowed to keep deer in it which he had exclusive hunting rights so it's a way of sort of making sure you can you know feed yourself the venison that you think you deserve um many other stately homes followed suit so you'll often find these deer parks on the estates usually around the house but not always um, if you go down to the deer park at Durham now, you sadly won't see any deer because they all have to be put down when the TB hit. Um, but there are actually, um, what's the TB, foot and mouth hit, but they are actually coming back. They are going to reintroduce them. Um, estate surveys, we can, these contain fantastic information um, and they were taken at fairly red, red, regular intervals although sometimes oddly there's not much information so it's a real curious egg here sometimes you'll be lucky and strike gold other estates very little and again this is a basic survey from the Durham estate and taken in 1710 November and it's an example of a really nice survey so they've given you tenants names the buildings they had field names and rent and there's information about the actual tenant and the holding there and you can read through these and it really does convey a lot of information so if you're doing sort of family history and you know you had a sort of a, 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 a relative and ancestor who was on one of these estates it's always worth looking to try Try and find these estate surveys just to see if there's anything there useful um, I say some some you're lucky some there's lots others there's not very much um, a quick look at the household staff 
you had the indoor staff. This is what the household ones were. There were generally four. They were in charge of everything. So you had the house steward. He was in overall charge of the whole setup. If the family had more than one residence, and by and large they did, they usually had a house in town, as it were, in London. You then had the butler, who was the actual head of the individual house staff in charge of that pantry, wine cellar, dining room. The housekeeper, who was responsible for house and its appearance and all charge of all female servants. And then you had the cook chef in charge of the kitchen and kitchen staff and those four sort of had their own um sort of sub hierarch hierarchies under them um we don't actually find that much information on these i have to say I, i've not come across very much so if you know we might get staff wages um very often you will not get individual staff named and i just have a quick slip of water where you have a look at that list of these are the various higher the people who are under these top four Um, and I should say, say this isn't a photograph from any of the, the uh, Gloucestershire estates. I couldn't find one. And I couldn't find one in our collections either. So, you know, I suppose it might be quite a rare occurrence to get this sort of information. Um, having just said that, we do have this fantastic picture um, from the Doddington estate, which shows the ground staff in 1890. And it's a wonderful picture. It's one of my favorite things in the archives. Um, and it's got all the people who worked on the outside estates there. So you've got the head gardener. He's the guy actually in the middle with a big sort of top hat on and this sort of sat up in the, the first row. You've got the head keeper. He sat next to him. You've got gardeners. There's seven there. You've got cowmen, four keepers or gameskeepers. You've got the blacksmith. He's on the far left hand side. You can see him with the white shirt. If you have a quick look at his box, he's got a box of nails and horseshoes there. Um, you've also got a carter. He's, um, I can't wait to win here. I can't remember which which one he is now. He's one at the back, I think. Um, you've got partly his groom, stableman, and a helper, and that's one of the boys. What's beautiful about this photograph is it's 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 actually very very good quality. It's it's quite high resolution, um, and also in the original, all those staff are named on it except for one, who is the chap on the bottom left hand side, sat next to the sleeping dog. Um, he's the only one who's not got a name. The rest are all named. There are brothers in there, and if you look at the census, you can trace these people. You know, you can see they were working there, and, and you can see the families were there. So it's 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 a really great photograph. Um, sadly, we don't get too many of those. I, I Wish they had it would be fantastic to be able to name all these people and the other thing i quite like about this photo as i mentioned it with the blacksmith is if you have a look the people are actually identified by what they're using so you've got a couple of sides at the back there you've got the chap on the front uh, front row above the dog with a shotgun you know this is the carpenter's got his saw the woodsman's got his saw interestingly a chap in the second row at the back who is that's the head gardener i should say um he's actually got some sort of stick we don't know what it is it looks like a it looks like a truncheon with a silver end um um, you know, it may be it's some sort of badge of office or something, but we're not sure what that is. So, you know, um, in the exhibition that will accompany this or be put up in the next week or so, this picture is on there with the names of the people. Um, so have a good look at that. And if anybody gets an idea of what that chap could be holding, we'd love to know. I've spoken to a chap called the Historic Gardener who... who, who, who there's a lot of reenactment and a lot knows a lot of research about gardens from literally Neolithic times onwards. Um, and he's not sure what it is. He can't identify it either. So if you do know, let us know. We'd be really happy to find out. Um, small houses obviously needed fewer staff. And as time passed, staff numbers tended to reduce partly due to automation that was starting to come in, but not fully. Um, Example from Old Down House at Olverston, again in South Gloss, and it shows the indoor and outside staff. And this is taken around about 1910, 1915, something like that, around about there. So you can see the, the numbers have much reduced now, and they don't need the huge numbers of people. Okay, it's a smaller house, a slightly smaller estate, um, you know, but it, it's still fairly substantial. Um, this actually links to the sort of the demise of the country house and then the final demise really began in World War I. Um, as the staff required to run the houses, they either left the fights or the men signed up to fight and they never returned. Or if they did come back, you know, they might not want to work there. Um, 
other ones were called away to walk, work in the war industry, especially some of the, the women. Um, and I'd say of those who did return, many left the countryside. They could find better paid jobs in towns and cities. And at the same time, you know, try and sort of get some money back into the country. The inheritance tax post-war it went up quite dramatically and this forced a breakup of many of these big estates that had been passed down intact. Now the big three in Gloucestershire survived this by and large but they, we know they did actually sell off some of their land so they, they had to do this but they were able to survive. Um, what do you do with your elderly and retired servants? Um, many of them, um, if they were relieved of the more arduous task they had to do, they simply kept going. So cooks often walked, worked well into their 60s and butlers worked for as long as they could carry a tray, um, even longer in some cases. Um, <laughs> But sort of some landed gentry felt this noblesse obligé. Um, they provided tied cottages for retired staff or pinched them off with their own families and gave them an annuity to last until they died. Um, of course, you know, the earth thing we've got to think about, you know, if you want to do your house, why not do it big style? Um, Badminton, the first Duchess of Badminton, she built this beautiful row of almshouses and now grade two listed. And they built it around 1714 purposely to house retired estate servants and they are still there I, I think they're in private ownership now i say private ownership they're private renting I should say they're not them for servants um, of course you know if you are actually a servant you're getting most of your food being paid for most of your fun time being paid for you're getting your rent being part of the parcel so you can actually save up quite a lot of money and um, some servants managed to save lots of money so they could retire quite happily um, although there are examples where some servants not very well paid not very good with their money they simply had to retire to workhouses so it, again it's a it's a bit of a sort of six or one half dozen the other situation on this one <coughs> excuse me Um, outbuildings. So all estates and their houses and estates needed outbuildings to function. Um, at Badminton, these are particularly well developed. Um, they included stables, a brewery, kennels, a laundry, sawmill, timber yard, and that's blacksmith. So that's sort of everything you need to keep this estate running. And at Badminton, it's also quite close to the main house. As you can see, this is one of the, just a simple shot, one ordinance survey from Know Your Place. Um, ice houses, um, obviously before refrigeration, the only way you could cool things um, was ice. So country houses often had ice houses to store ice all year round. Um, they were generally underground pits or tunnels with small entrances to keep the cold in. And they were filled up with ice and snow in the winter. And basically this slowly defrosted over the summer. This is the plan of the ice house at Doddington, um, which was the plan was drawn by Capability Brown. We're not 100% certain if he actually made it. Um, you know, you'll notice the shape of it. It's sort of fairly conical in shape. There's a little well at the bottom to collect any water that actually drained out. Um, and then over the top of it, it usually had a stone or brick dome. And over the top of that, it had a thatched roof. And one of the advantages of this thatched roof is you could actually wet it in the summertime. So you enhance the cooling. So you kept the ice cold. So they were actually very, very clever things. Um, if you go up to the Avoncroft Museum, you can actually go inside the nice house they've actually built there. Um, from one of the country houses up there that way. This one at Donington, we think it's still there. I'm not 100% certain. I've not been able to get a very good idea. Of where, uh, and then we'll see why maybe in a, in a moment or so. Um, dovecots. Um, I love this quote from Olivier de Serres and his the Theatre of Agriculture from 1600. No man need ever have an ill provisioned house if there be but attached to it a dovecot, a warren, and a fish pond. Um, I don't think I could sort that in my garden, but it'd be a nice try. Um, Pigeon doves are obviously a very important source of meat, and if you bred them, you kept them, you could almost had meat to hand. So most country houses possessed dovecots, often more than one, to farm them. Um, Doddington, as I said, had an ornamental pigeon loft. Now we think it might have incorporated the ice house, so it might have been built on top of the ice house, um, but none of the maps are overly clear on this, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of information in the archive about it, other than sort of the drawing of the ice house. It, it hasn't mentioned whether they've stuck a dovecot on top um again it'd be nice to go and have a look but you know you'd have to ask mr dyson whether he'd let you on his land and i suspect the answer would be no 
Um, however, we know there's other ones running around. Uh, Babington have this lovely circular dovecot. You can see it in the centre of this image here. Um, we know it was there by 1705, although like many dovecots, it was totally demolished in 1710, along with the southern range of the house when they did some of the rebuilding. So, you know, these things aren't permanent and then they can come and go. Having said that, the Babington State have several other ones. The oldest one is this one in the top right here, which is a little Babington, <coughs> but it was still owned by the main estate. Um, we know it's a medieval one, and it's also a survivor because it's on a deserted medieval village site, but it was kept up anyway. And um, the other two at the bottom, this is called known as Cost Castle Barn. It's on the west of the village, about two miles away. Um, and again, rather extravagant barn with these it's called castellated, crenellated towers, towers, towers on it. But this, these two were also dove cuts. So, you know, they obviously ate a lot of pigeon or dove in, in badminton. I don't blame them, it's quite nice. Um, other estate buildings, um, of course, the country had states and they used to have land agents who over time took away the burden of running the estate from the actual owners. Um, if anybody's watched Clarkson's farm, you know, you'll see the land agent there dealing with Jeremy Clarkson. You can imagine it's the same sort of thing going on. But these, these estates and the land agents often brought good investment and in infrastructure, especially in post enclosure times when it was in their own interest to do it um, so they could make more profit, basically. And so they would invest in, in buildings they needed to use, new barns and things. And they often encourage tenants to improve the husbandry and farming techniques. They could do this through leases. So they could lease some of the land. If they didn't like it or they didn't like what I'm doing, sorry, you've lost the lease. So, you know, they could be quite cutthroat. And lots of the sort of the, um, how should I say it, the um, solicitor side of the East country states deal with leasing, leasing lands, leasing farms, etc., etc. But as well as maintaining dwellings and farm buildings, um, states often would build new ones if they're acquired. So if you could prove a case to your landlord, you know, your landlord, the lord, that you needed a new barn to store it because you've increased your farm production so much, they would often do it and then they didn't worry about it too much. Um, and these sort of policies actually became a major factor in how the rationalisation of all these farms took place. And it also caused the emergence of bigger farms, which we can argue we're sort of lumbered with today where you have sort of you know fairly small farms and suddenly you've got on a massive estate and one of the best examples locally is Chedworth where you've got the, the massive estate around there only a couple of actually small privately owned farms. Um, special estate buildings again as required the states would fund them so you're getting things such as sawmills water mills and windmills being built um, and this again is a fantastic document from Badminton State detailing and erecting a corn mill in 1766 um, it's the estimate of the prices it's wonderful um, we know this one is for a windmill because uh, about on the fourth entry down you'll see four sailcloths for £24 um, a 12 pound rather um, and basically you know that's about a thousand two hundred today the whole thing cost about 230 pound then about twenty four thousand today so this is a considerable investment you're going to make on your estate to keep it keep it profitable and keep money coming in um, this is another one from the badminton and say we're so thankful for the badminton estate for allowing us to show these this is an estimate for replacing the machinery in a water mill um, again the details in the bottom left there it's hard to read on the small screen but it's better on the exhibition we'll do it's two foot wide wheel 18 foot diameter um, classical arrangement of grinding stone was French the other was Welsh um, there's a lot of information about that on the mill various mill websites basically the French stones were composite stones but they were often preferred to the solid grinding stones and so often they put them in, in sort of tandem the cost here 110 pounds about 11,000 today so again you you actually are investing quite a lot of money in this machine this equipment and machinery What's beautiful this document there, look at those two beautiful diagrams of the machinery. You're not actually seeing the water wheel here. The big wheel there is what they call the pit wheel, which is one of the motors, the motors, one of the wheels that actually dips up the road to the, uh, uh, the actual mill. And again, I've gone into a little bit of that on the exhibition so you can read about how these things function. But again, you know, fantastic drawings here. Tide cottages, um, tide accommodation became commonplace in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, especially where the property owner, the estate or public, whoever it was, um, could control who lived in the properties. And you know, tidewood cottages, generally very small, basic, 
rent was usually quite minimal and it was often considered a, a, a sort of perk of the job so you know you could get this so you had a job for life if you could you know, and it was great people really liked it um the only drawbacks obviously that if the worker left the estate they usually left the cottage so tied cottages were seen as a means for employers to hold down wages as well compared to other industries and also it inhibited workers from joining trade unions which are starting to sort of come up around there so there's pluses and minuses there and these two again are straight from the back state where the gate built a lot of houses around the village there for their workers um, state villages again we stick with badminton on this one because it's it's a great example of an estate village um you know it's got a high street down there lined with the state houses it's got the alms houses which the lady built obviously for the retired staff it's got a vicarage for your sort of your vicar in hand to do the, the, the family business um also it's got a free school and um, that is again founded in 1705 by the Dutch of both for the children of the workers so you know sometimes these estates put a lot of effort into the social Social side of things as well um, the brewery which is on the right on the corner there you know that would sort of serve the village with beer as well so you know it, it for many of the workers it was probably you know they, why do they need to travel they could just stay in badminton all their lives if they needed to a quick look at lakes um, there's actually very little information you get the odd drawings you know which on the maps and things and the odd painting but you never get any sort of instructional or constructional information on them which is a quite a shame you'll get amounts of you know how much it costs to dig but other than that very very little um all the three houses have or have or had them i should say large ornamental lakes donington's got the two big ones running roughly north south very uh, sort of elaborate cascade between the two which was a feature of the house um these lakes were often they were dug up enlarged filled in all over the place so again you know have a look on the know your place maps which these are from you know and you can get an idea of comparing it to modern days what exists and what doesn't now um not all of the lakes are what they seem however so we have this one it's hidden away on the what would call the unfashionable side of bamberton house it's a very plain lake no fountains no statues but there is a lamp lead, a ramp i should say not a lamp a ramp leading into it on its western size um and this actually gives away what it's for because there's actually um on the north side of the stables and in this map picture here the stables are numbered 183 and the lakes obviously 186 it's a horse pond and so they would sort of they excise the horses they would bring them out put them into the its pond where they could drink and they could wash them down so again nothing to do with the ornamental side of it there's a one sundial i think there in the gardens now but it was actually used you know it's actually critical for the horses obviously because of the badminton they love the hunting with the bow foot hunt and all that malarkey you know they needed how to be able to look after their sort of horses as well um interesting on this one there is also on the map if you see there's a little little p letter p and that's a pump um and it's seemingly linked to the laundry now again and the laundry is the building little squared quadrangle there just next to the p we're not quite sure why this pump is there is it pumping water from the lake to the laundry which let's face it if you've washed down horses and they've deposited lots of stuff in there you maybe wouldn't want to wash your clothes in or is it dumping material water used from the laundry to the lake which could be full of soda and things like that so it's you know it's interesting when that and I've, I've not been able to find out anything about that pump um interestingly the plot there numbered 187 is what they call the drying grounds and most big houses also had a couple of big fields nearby where they're actually used for drying the laundry either on racks or just line it out on the ground in the sun to bleach so again if you look at these houses it's always worth looking for that sort of thing uh, state accounts most estates kept good accounts usually in bound volumes and they had summaries of receipts expenses etc etc they are quite big this is why this image for example is quite small and it's difficult you're not going to be able to read any of it so we'll, in a minute we'll show zooms in some various ones um you know and they are quite good if you're lucky you get a good run of estate accounts if you're unlucky it's very piecemeal and they record a wealth of fascinating information about how these places were run and what they did. Um, this is a classic example. This is from Doddington from March, April 1760. Um, and I'll just say, I'll let you look at us, put these up. It shows you what this house was spending its money on. <laughs> so you've got oysters from London a shilling you know shilling and eightpence you know that's nothing today fish from portsmouth again shilling and five pence 
26 faggots for the house and this isn't faggots that you're going to eat in the kitchen this is faggots of firewood basically to, to get your fires going um the sacks interestingly is one of the most expensive expensive things on there that's quite expensive that's you know i think where is it i can't see it now um but that i know i remember looking at it before um at the bottom two years wages doesn't say who to so we don't know who it's for but 10 quid for two years five pound a year you know i think i'd rather work for a little bit more than that even then um household accounts are similar so the first that one was your state accounts these are household accounts this is again from doddington because they probably to be honest they probably got the best run of accounts so this is for F february 1838 and they've itemized it kitchen bills household bills pantry and cellar bills um and some of the expenditures here i've just again listed it out very quickly it's not all of it so we've got bread tallow meat poultry charcoal butter and ham you know and you can find some fascinating things amongst these you know there are i came across uh, entries for artichokes and things like that and asparagus so there are sort of things in there you can see um again this is a bit of a detail so this gives you doddington's housekeeper's monthly accounts and it's a summary total so it actually says here total for soaps candles turnery lamp oil sundries 191 pounds a month that's a lot of money total for the kitchen as we looked at on the opposite page almost 500 pound servants wages 300 pound board wages for servants these were servants that were employed as and when sort of like um what the thingy contracts today i can't remember what they're called they're just top of my head um, zero hours that's it yeah zero hour contracts you know they were paying that they retained them with it um but servants jobs for servants and traveling expenses job servants are those who would come in need a carpenter to mend the chair or something like that so for one month thousand pound about fifty two thousand pound in today's money wow. these houses needed to generate an awful lot of money to keep going you know so it, it's a fascinating thing you know I'd, I'd love to see some of the you know see analysis of what some of this stuff would be it'd be fascinating um again on that previous page we have the food for 446 pounds eight shillings and seven pence um this is a detailed one for that one uh, and it includes these entries here so that's an awful lot of stuff um i interest especially like the fact you've got westmoreland and westphalia ham mentioned they also didn't grow their own fruit not many because it was out of season where are we? it's february wasn't it so maybe you're not getting apples and pears and dessert apples bakery bills the confectioners bills you know 15 pound in confectionery there's a bit of a sweet tooth there um the beer bill 37 quid that's not too bad is it you know we can get away with that <laughs> coffee whole pound you know so obviously i guess they probably didn't like coffee as much or depends how much you got for it i, I don't know what the going rate for coffee that was there um you do get sort of special accounts as well um and this is a rather nice one this is the estimated expenses of sir william codrington's 21st birthday which was basically a five-day party stroke banquet in march 1826 and the person who's written this is the steward he sort of itemized it all on the side what he thinks it's going to be um cost 223 pounds 14 shillings and eight pence about thirteen thousand pound today well, I mean, that's a good part, isn't it? A ton of beef, mutton and veal, 200 loaves of bread, 76 pounds of butter, 194 pounds of sugar and 18 quarts of cream. Um, that's bad. Alcohol, you need alcohol for 21st birthday party. 36 bottles of port, 36 bottles of white wine, 23 and a half gallons of rum and 200 gallons of beer. I mean, that's a fantastic party. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be done. The hangovers after that must have been immense. Um, and the very bottom, the, the writing there, um, they've actually put there are um, no doubt a number of um, trifling items not accounted for in this list. <laughs> you don't know what they're going to be. I think one interesting fact there's hardly any cheese here, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, yeah, only six pounds of cheese, you know, for three shillings for your cheese. You know, you've you thought you'd, you'd need more cheese than that. You know, you've got the pineapples after all. <laughs> but anyway, there's a great account. <laughs> really good one i have to say and again this is an exhibition so you can see it fully um christmas treats some mistakes were very good to their servants at christmas and the doddingtons were very good on this one so this is basically the uh, they invited the local villagers who again were probably tied servants or families of tied servants into the house um for, for, for the christmas dinner um 
this is a list of who's who's coming up and it's very again it's a nice little list for some reason didn't take part in 1879 i don't know why that did that was you know i can't think of anything sort of scary that particularly happened there it would stop sort of donington entertain his workers but they didn't come in but again it just goes to show that some of these estates were very kind and very helpful you know, especially around there when they wanted to celebrate it um if they couldn't come in or they didn't want to come in, then Doddington gave them a food donation, um, typically a quantity of beef and a plum pudding. Um, list them. There are a couple of names on here which are the same families by the look of it. So some got food and came in by the look of it. Um, so it's again, it's, it's a nice little reminder of what, what they could do. Um, Hochin, ever present annoyance of the land with gentry, uh, estate agent, estate agents, states would issue private notices against trespassing on their lands to those suspected of poaching, warning them if they did, if they were caught on estate land, they would be prosecuted. And this example comes from the Durham estate in 1796, issued by the Durham estate and given to Moses Higgs as the offender. And it basically bans him from entering estate lands or with or without dogs or guns or snares. So they're trying to blanket one here that he can't come onto their land at all. The other side of poaching, you get the gamekeepers. So to counter poachers and keep your states in order, you've got gamekeepers. Um, this is a, a document from Durham. Again, it's got very bad ink bleed through, sadly, so it's hard to read. But it's agreeing with John Long to serve as a keeper of the park at Durham. Um, he would use the utmost care and diligence both in the park and warrens and doing all other things to the office of a keeper and which is chucking us off the rabbits, obviously. And their main task was to protect the deer and the rabbits and the stuff, and also keep, keep the wood safe, so protect any timber, it be it felled or not felled yet, and thieves, and also, you know, kill everything else that moved, basically. Um, you know, be that fox or be that poachers. Although they didn't shoot foxes very often, because obviously the Lord liked to run them down with dogs. Um, Log had an annual rage, got the use of the lodge at the home, uh, but he had to pay for his own fires, um, but though he did receive a load of coal once a year, and that's in the estate, and it's actually a two-part document, this, it goes on for quite a while. Um, there are often lots of miscellaneous records, um, and again, this, this is a rather nice one, um, and it's got actually, what's liked about this one, it's a family photo album for the Codringtons, uh, and it's got general views of the estate, but interestingly on these, you might just be able to make out, um, for example, the top two photos on, on the left-hand side, these are Belgian refugees in World War I, so the family took in some refugees, but we don't know much about this, we don't know whether they stayed with the family or they're just visiting, presumably they gave them cottages on the estates, we just don't know it's not that information around so again sometimes you get these miscellaneous records that can be quite interesting so what sort of records might have survived so generally you've got these sort of lists maps and plans rent records deeds leases wage accounts estate records records of other businesses on the estate sometimes these estate records often they include family and personal records etc diaries letters pedigrees if the family are political or they've got mps you generally get a much larger family collection um, military again if they've been serving the military which a lot of the sort of the first or second sons would do they would actually find information you know you get lots of information there and very often you get records relating to the family's uses in the sort of the local areas so with churches charities schools etc etc each collection is different however but there are often records that a similar in form and purpose um, and we've got a classification scheme that we tend to use for estate records um, you know and again so if you see something with an m on the end it's generally a manorial record if it's an e it's an estate record etc etc um, it's important to remember that no two estates that were run the same way um, and some might not even have kept documents you think they should have done or, you know, or they've been lost we don't know there are lots of gaps in these records um, one last thing to point out is the handwriting can be abysmal and it can really be hard to, to, to sort of to read. So again, yeah, always as always, take it slow, get your eye in it. Um, film what do they do now well film tv work um many of these country houses now look to film tv to boost incomes durham house and badminton were in the remains of the day um well doddington featured in the period not well known period drama barry linden so you often get films there so if you're going to go visit any of these places you know always worth check on the website because sometimes they're closed for filming um and it, it does it can't can happen it happened a few weeks ago i was going to go somewhere and it was shut so bear that in mind
Um, lastly, you don't get that many family photographs, but I love this one. Um, this is from the Barclays of Spetchley, so this is way out of our district, but I love this picture. Uh, and it's a great, I think it's a murder mystery in the, in the making here. And if you look at these people, firstly, I draw your attention to the two old girls in the front. They hate each other, don't they? Look at them. <laughs> You know, they've got that. Like, behind them, you've got the, the army captain. He went to the army. He married somebody who probably is not that bright. Maybe she doesn't look that bright, being cruel and everything. But, you know, you can imagine this is an Agatha Christie. So I'll just give you a second to see if you can spot who you think the murderer might be in this picture. <laughs> OK. So we've done this at archives. And we think the person who is the murderer is him. <laughs> Isn't that evil? You know, he's obviously started lacing the Arctic around anywhere. So, you know, he's going to knife somebody or stab somebody. So it's the classic, you know, Colonel Peacock in the, <laughs> the library with a candlestick. Um, there are some alternative views about these things. Um, if anybody knows Tom Robinson Band, I'm All Right Jack's a great little song. Um, you know, plenty of grace in the country house we're eating as we should. And Perkins running the farm, half dozen shotguns in the Land Rover ready for call to arms. And the gin traps down around the grounds, trip rise out in the woods. Don't you worry, I'm all right, Jack. We've never had it so good. Um, it's good, it's a great song. And it's, it's a quite an alternative view. So that brings us to, to the close of the talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a bit of a romp through, there's a lot to cover, but I would say happy to try and take some questions um, of either Zoom 30 if you've got any. I'll do my best to answer them, but say this isn't my 100% specialist subject, but I'll try. But I hope Thank you, John. Could you stop sharing your screen? Yep. I'll do and that then we now. can. There we go. That's great. So if you want to ask a question, um, just remember to take yourself off. Um, mute so we can hear you. John, a couple of things came in on the chat, which yeah. I'll just put those to you first. So first was from Angela Eaton. Um, what is ternary? That was something that was listed in the household accounts. Yeah, that's right, ternary. Um, I remember being quite puzzled over this at the time and I couldn't figure out what it is. And it literally, as far as, I'm, as, far as I could find out, it literally is wood turning. So there might be another explanation for it, but what I found it was that somebody that's actually turning the wood down. So I imagine it's replacing broken chairs, the legs, the things like that. That seemed to be the most logical one I could see, but it certainly would work. Um, it, I will have another look at that because I can't remember it full of Tom head. But if I do find it's different, we can let you know. But I'm sure it's just actually is you know, turning wood down for various things. Thank you, John. So uh, an interesting point from Pam Morris, who asked, was it Doddington that had the slave plantation connections because that could explain all that rum at the 21st birthday party? It could, yeah, that could be it. You know, maybe maybe you got 100 slaves for a birthday present as well. We don't know, but it was, it was Doddington. Um, so it was the Codrington family, um, you know, and, for, you know, <sighs> This, this is a real tricky subject for us at the moment, you know, and we can't hide this sort of thing. You know, most of these country houses had some connection to the slave trade. There's no doubt about it. And I said, it's, it's worth looking at the National Trust um, website because they've done a really, really good in-depth investigation of it. Um, there will be coming one coming out for the city of Gloucester's link soon. That, that's in the pipeline. We've put some work into that. Um, but, you know, it, it does just goes to show that, 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 you know, all this stuff was interlinked and, and you know, that there's no getting away from from it today sadly you know and it's however horrific it was and it was horrific um you know this is what was done at the time you know we, we difficult to judge them by our standards in a way but yeah, i think we have to sometimes but yeah so that was definitely that might have been you know the one reason they had so much money to spend on this party you notice he was already a sir as well at the age of 21 so you know again yeah, yeah. Lift, i like the idea of all that rum being imported um just one more in the chat and that's some um, from daisy Daisy Bicknell, what sort of businesses would have supported the household income? So I suppose that's the like the people, the owners of the house. Yeah, so largely they they I mean they're gonna be there's gonna be like they do these, there's gonna be investing in various sort of high level schemes of you know, for an example, the South Seas bubble, that sort of thing. So they're investing money elsewhere, but also they're getting income from the tenants of the estate. And that's where they got sort of like the bread and butter income. So they would you know they had some farm that they'd farm themselves so they could get profits from that, but also they rented out all these properties, so they're all getting money from that. So that's that's the bulk one anyway but uh, you know of course you, they're going to be investing money in the banks as well so it's so it's basically income from farms and tenants and then investing their own money thank you um, has anyone else got a question for john 
unmute yourself or show yourself. I have one actually, if nobody else does, and that's about um, Hynham Court, John, which is obviously in my mind because that's near where I live in Newark, yep. so it's on my way to home. So where does that fit in, in into the sort of hierarchy of um, stately homes? Is, that, is it quite a minor one or? It isn't, yeah, it probably wasn't. It, it was, it's a nice, a beautiful house, and, and, and I'll plug here um, Charlie's Cancer Charity. They've got an event there uh, this Sunday coming up. Go on to Charlie's, go and there's going to be afternoon tea, things to look at, go around the garden. So it's going to be a really nice day if the weather holds, been crossed. Um, Hindem, it's a really interesting state. Um, it's been there quite a while, it was much bigger once. Um, it has reduced down, but it came to be sort of a middling size. They owned a fair bit of land around it. Um, Cook, I think it was, he was a, a it was Cook, wasn't it? Yeah, he was a parliamentarian. Um, of course, the Welsh occupied it for a while in the civil, English Civil War. Um, and the house has sort of been, you know, demolished, knocked down, rebuilt a couple of times. There used to be a chapel on site. So I would say that's sort of like a, if you've got badminton and the big houses at one, I'd say that's sort of like a, two and a half to three size house so again it's a lovely house beautiful orangey you have to say it's really nice it's lovely it's a much smaller estate now than it used to be but yes yeah, it's, it's, it's worth going i'd say plug again charlie's this saturday get tickets to the website big fun day yeah if you haven't been it, it's really it is a beautiful place too so is yeah. that it nobody else got anything else to ask all right, well, thank you all so much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the talk today. Thank you, John, for being interesting and entertaining as always. Um, so there was a question, was it the ternary one that we were going to look into? Yeah, I'll, I'll double check the ternary. Anymore? Get back to Ang Angela, was not Angela? I'll, I'll double check that. I'm sure it's that, um, you know, because uh, I was puzzled by it at first. I remember thinking, oh God, yeah, it's obvious. So yeah, I'll, I'm sure it is. But if we've got, Ang if Ange can leave an email with us, we'll get back to her on that and just double check it. Okay, that's lovely. So um, we, we will have Angela's oh, email yeah, and we can do that. Okay, all right. Well, thank you all very much for coming and um, see you all next time. Um, take care, everybody. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank see you, you soon. Bye.